All right, you ready to get in the Word? You got your Bibles? You got notepads, things to write down? All right, good. <laughs> Amen. So let's go ahead and open and pray and ask God to make the Word real to us. You see, we can read the Word, but then we can have the Word revealed to us. And so you want God to anoint my lips and be able to share what the Spirit is saying through me as an oracle or, or as a mouthpiece or a speaker, you know, a modern term. So, Father, we just lift the Word of God up to you, Father. You said, Jesus, if I be lifted up, I would draw all men nigh unto me. Lord, we lift up the Word of God at this church. Lord, it's all based and built around your Son as a firm foundation for our feet. Our feet. Father, we hear the word and then we do the word and it becomes a strong foundation where the winds blow and the, the floods come, but it cannot shake the house because we founded our life upon your rock, hearing and doing your word. Father, thank you so much. You'll bring it revelation knowledge as we share in Jesus' name. And everyone said... everybody. Amen. I love the backdrop on that. We've been teaching on new creation realities, and we're going to step just a little bit to the right, and we're going to call this God's wisdom in four nuggets. We're going to give you four nuggets for Christians to grasp and to practice in their life. Now, something that Linda and I agreed on a long, long time ago was that when we would get involved in ministry again, we would give things to you that would be quality for your walk. In other words, I'm just not going to preach at you, or I'm not going to tell you to straighten up. We're going to give you things in the Word of God for you to put to practice so your walk becomes better. That's what church is really all about. It's teaching you how to walk with God and fall in love with Him all more and more. Look at somebody next to you and say, fall in love with God. Amen. <laughs> Amen. And we know it's not what we hear, it's what we catch. So a couple of things before we get to our scripture back there is number one, do you know the difference between confidence and pride? Do you know the difference between confidence and pride? I'm going to give you that definition. I hope you got something to write it down. Confidence is confidence in God, not in self. Everyone say confidence in God. Not in self. Aren't we supposed to be self-confident? So that's what the world teaches us. But you know, I was self-conscious at first. I was real sure of myself. And along the way, I certainly offended a lot of people. <laughs> but you don't need to be self-confident. You just need to be God-confident. Can you say amen? But pride is a different thing. When you look at somebody who's really confident in God, it looks prideful. Because they're talking as if they know, and they're sharing as if it's a reality, you know. And we look at that, and we go, nobody really knows that. That's what you, you need to understand. There's a difference between confidence in the Word and confidence in God and self-confidence in our pride. Now, how many here know the Spirit resists the and gives grace to the... So the best way for you to give places with God is to humble yourself in the sight of the Lord. So every day when you get up, Lord, cleanse me, wash me, and I humble myself in your presence. You think you can do that? If you can do that, then immediately your flesh switches off and your spirit and your soul opens up. And Jesus said, remember, this kind comes forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. 
Do you know what he was talking about? Remember, his disciples came to Jesus and said, we can't cast the devil out of this boy. Remember, the spirit threw him down into the fire and then into the water. And, and then by the time Jesus had got to them, they were powerless because they were arguing about who was the greatest in the kingdom. Their mind was everybody was everywhere else but on God. And by the time Jesus showed up, they said, we can't cast him out. And Jesus looks at him and he says, this kind comes out by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Now, everybody thinks, says, oh, yeah, devils only come out by prayer and fasting. No, that wasn't what he was saying. He was saying, look at fellas, you have messed up the anointing so bad and you're set in such unbelief, the only way that you can get cured is you need to fast and pray so the power of God is, is not hindered anymore. So everybody thinks he was talking about devils coming out by fasting and prayer. No, devils come out in the name of Jesus. You should have a fasted and prayed life. Can you say amen? But that keeps us from getting too prideful. Remember we started out, what's the difference between pride and confidence? The, the difference is results, miracles, signs, wonders. Because God won't work through a proud person. So don't judge anybody as being proud. Pray for anybody that you see might not be flowing as you see fit. Pray for me. But do not speak evil against the body of Christ. In this hour that you and I live in, we have been warned four times. Not because we do in it. But the church in the Northwest have been warned not to pick on other churches or comment negatively against another brother's sister. Say amen. Even if they're looking like a flake, our job is not to attack what belongs to God. Do you hear me? I'm trying to teach you how to get your walk going so that you have less shrapnel coming your way. I don't know, a bomb's bursting in air. If you're in an airplane, you don't want that. All right, so let's get into this. Let's look at our scripture, everyone. God's wisdom and four nuggets. God's wisdom and four nuggets. Let's look at our scripture. Bing! All right. Hear my son and receive my sayings. What was the first word? Hear. All right. The word hear there means to really... Pay close, focused attention. Hear my son and receive my sayings, and the years of your life will be what? Many. I have taught you in the ways of wisdom. I have led you in the right paths. When you walk, your steps will not be hindered. Boy, have you ever felt like your steps are being hindered on the job, maybe somewhere else? We're going to teach you today how to keep that from happening. And when you run, you will not stumble. How many years into that? No stumbling. Take firm hold of instructions. Do not let go. Amen. So how many here is not what you're taught? It's what? You ready? What, it's what you caught. I knew you could catch that. Amen. Throw it back. Excellent. I'll sign you up. One of these days, it would be nice to have a, a little ball team or something. We used to have them back in my older church. We had two until I found out. This is me telling, and then we'll get in the lesson. That they were having people who played baseball professionally come join the team that weren't part of the church. So, yeah, so we had two of the hottest, best baseball teams around. And I, I went to Dennis, I won't say his last name, but Dennis was a friend of mine. And I said, what are you doing, Dennis? He says, I'm tired of looking at church people who don't know what they're doing. I said, what are you saying? I got all my friends that know how to play, and we're winning. I said, well, guess what? I just shut the whole baseball thing right down because you're cheating. You're not doing it as a good testimony. And one thing I want to share with you, don't be a Christian and think you can cut corners and God not notice. Okay, we want to let you know that the little foxes sometimes we think is no big deal can be a big deal one day. So we want to be sensitive. Are you with me? All right. Get a hold of wisdom. So good morning. We're going to show and share four nuggets with you. And we're going to read Proverbs 133. So let me read it to you. The most important thing for us to realize is to understand the word and to put it to practice. Say amen. And it's, again, not what we just are taught, but what we caught in our heart as being the truth. 
He will open our spiritual eyes and we'll be hearers of the word and we'll be seers of God's spiritual things. This is the spirit wind that God wants us to catch in this move of God. How many here know that we're in a revival? Now, you might not see a whole lot or hear about it now because the old split toe is shut down the news, but the revivals are getting hotter and they're becoming more all around the world. People are praying and seeking God. We don't hear about it, but if you're with God and you're ministering to God and meeting with God, he's letting you know what's going on so you'll catch the spirit wind. Say amen. So he says, listen, whoever listens to me, God says, will dwell safely. How many's into safe dwelling? And will be quiet and secure without having any fear of evil. Does that sound pretty secure? All we have to do is be a good listener and a good doer of the word. Say amen. So we're going to cover these four things more and more than I've ever seen before. Is I see a lot of people that love God. I mean, there's more people I think on the planet that love God than ever probably ever was. And man, it, churches that got five, 10,000 people and they all loving God is just wonderful. Can you say amen? It's just marvelous. Amen. But you know, what I find is a lot of Christians know about God, but they don't know him as intimately as they should. Now, I'm not picking on anybody, but it's when we get real close to someone, we really get to know them. And you can't just get real close to God by coming to a church. you got to have God in your home life. You have to have a prayer life. You have to start your day off in that realm so that God and you partner up. Can you say amen? That he lets us in on what he's doing. I don't know about you, but I used to be one of those guys who used to be the last to, to, to hear what was going on. No, I want to be one of the first to hear it. And the Bible says that Jehovah Nessie will catch the wind of the Spirit, and the Spirit of God will reveal to us what he's doing. But we've got to get us out of the way. Someone say us out of the way. So we're going to cover these four areas. The first one is what a lot of Christians don't focus on. Knowing that God dwells in them, and knowing that God, uh, they dwell in God. Did you know Christians don't dwell on that? They know God. How many here know God's in you? Christ in you, the hope of glory. But how many here are realizing that we're also in God? Hello? That's a hard one for our head to get around. Now, does the scripture say we're in God? Yes. It's as if any man be in where? So if I'm in the building, am I in the parking lot? If I'm in the building, am I in my car? If I purpose to be in Christ, then am I in Christ? Yes. The only thing that challenges that is the way you think about stuff. The reason God gave you a mind is to have the right image about what he's telling you so you can understand. The purpose of communication is for you to understand from my mouth to your mouth so we understand the purpose. The purpose of the word of God is to give us a clear understanding of what God did, what God is doing, and how God has provided for us. Can you say amen, anyone? Amen. So we are in God. And this is where Christians don't focus. They're asking God in heaven, oh, meet my need. And it's okay. But what they don't understand is they got God inside of them. Now that changes things. You see, I don't fight as one who beats the air, Paul says. But I fight knowing who I serve. And what is he saying? Fight. We have an enemy, don't we? And we don't, in, listen, we don't, in, we're not to engage the enemy personally. We are to engage God who lives in us to the enemy. So in other words, you're a projector. How many's ever used a squirt gun? You got tired of always getting squirted, so you got one of the big guys. You know? And the next time that person come around the corner, you blasted them. Well, see, as long as a Christian thinks that God is there and, and, you re, and you hear songs, and now listen, just listen how funny it is. God's holding my hand and we're walking through life. He's holding your hand. I thought he lives in your heart. 
<laughs> you see? And so remember what we hear in peripheral words and all that's going on. I'd be careful. There's a lot of Christian songs I won't sing. I'm just dying to meet you. I'm crying with pain. It drove me to my knees, almost insane. And it's got a good beat to it. <laughs> I don't know about it. You ever heard some Christian songs? They need to not be played. And others are wonderful. Can you say amen? So you notice when we sing a song, what are we using? Words. And if you sing a word full of negative and, and cursing things, it's not what comes into a man, but it's what... Yeah, so remember the enemy uses your mouth. So one of the next things we're going to learn is the proper way of how to control our GPS. Everyone say guidance system. You have a guidance system. It's called your mouth. And it can lead you into trouble or it can lead you to success. Amen. Can you say amen? So not only God being in us, we're going to learn about God, uh, you know, about controlling our mouth. And then we're thirdly, we're going to learn about the mustard seed. Now, some people call it the mustard seed of faith. But if you read the first parable of the mustard seed, though it be smaller than all the other seeds, it will grow up larger than the rest. The mustard seed is Jesus. The mustard seed is his kingdom. Where does Jesus now dwell? In our heart, because we asked him in, right? Now, we know he dwells at the right hand of the Father, but he also dwells in us, and this is where the problem lies. We don't think God inside-minded. We think, help me, God, like he's gone somewhere. And that's where the trouble comes. You know, if you know you called the cops and they need to come immediately, but you know that their habit is to wait 45 minutes before they show up, that's not a good thing. If you think that every time you ask that God might change his mind and you're not sure about what he's going to do, then you will never be able to have faith enough to believe for the victory God has won for you. Say, I have victory as long as my mouth doesn't mess it up. And again, these are little truths. We'll show you all that. And then we're going to learn about having our eyes focused on Christ. Folks, we have a beautiful set of eyeballs. And they're designed to, for us to be single focused and not to be blurred or double focused. Can you say amen? So we're going to cover those four areas. So go with me to the first one. God dwells in us and we dwell in God. We're going to go to 1 John chapter 5. We're going to look at verse 18 through 21. Now, it's going to say some pretty wild things here. So let me explain before we get into this. <clears throat> How many here believe the word? How many here literally believe the word? Good, you should. The only time <clears throat> that you should... Look at shadows and patterns in the Word of God is when there are types and shadows and they're only metaphors. And there are a few of those, you know, and it's okay. You got to know when they are and when they're not. But here in Scripture, when Jesus is talking, there's no metaphors. There's only parables of understanding. So look at what it says in verse 18. We know that whoever is born of God does not what? Oh, boy. I don't know about you, but I've seen a plenty born again people sin. So let me explain. Who's talking here? John the Beloved, right? Who lived the longest of all the disciples? John the Beloved. Who had a revelation of how to dwell and be protected by God? John the Beloved. What is he trying to tell us here in this passage? He's trying to tell us what a real walk with God is like. Can you say amen? All right, he says, whatever, whoever is born of God does not sin. So let me ask you, there are three sections in your life. You're a spirit being, you have a soul, and you live in a body. Say, I'm a spirit being, I have a soul, and I live in a body. So when God came into your heart, he came right into your spirit man. He took out this sinful nature and put his nature in, and you became a new creation in Christ Jesus. Simple math, right? So, can God sin? So, let's wake up and realize that the God who lives in us must take control of our life. You're not going to become a robot. 
He just takes control, so he stands as a watchman looking out for you before you get into the future and into trouble. So by presenting yourself to God, all the equipment comes alive. How many of you ever remember? I watch a lot of science fix. I, um, how many remember the, the story about Independence Day? How many? Okay. And they had, they captured that spaceship. I'm just going to use it in illustration. But they couldn't turn it on. And then all of a sudden, it turned on. And then they found how it works. Well, that's like a lot of Christians. They'll get born again, they'll get fired up, and then they won't follow through, they don't get good teaching, and so they kind of just kind of go along, and they love God. But we need to understand what the will of the Lord is. We need to have a handle of how his principles and his kingdom works so we can work with our master, that we can work with our king, and that the enemy feels threatened and not laughs at our Christianity. Notice I paused for the cause. <laughs> Bless your hearts. Okay, now listen. And then he says, so inside your spirit, man, right where God lives, you cannot sin. But you can sin plenty from your thoughts. We can let our thoughts go, but we need to control our thoughts, don't we? And our flesh, can we, our, our flesh, we need to crucify our flesh on a daily basis. So in our flesh, we always fall short. In our mind, we wrestle between good and evil, but in our spirit, God lives. So we learn as Christians, and boy, I tell you what, you should have learned this first thing, how to walk from the inside out before God. You're going to make plenty of mistakes, but that's why God said about Job, he says, have you considered my servant Job? But there's none like him. Well, Job was a real mess. But God didn't look at his mess. He looked at his heart towards him. And if Christians could do that, we'd stop judging and start loving each other to the glory of God. Can you say amen? We're not to look at the outward man. We're to look at the inward man in faith and see the potential of God working in their hearts. Say amen. Now. Look at the next phrase. But he who has been born of God keeps himself. What do we keep ourselves? We keep ourselves in Jesus. Everyone say, keep yourself in Jesus. Keep yourself in Jesus. So when you get up in the morning, here's what I do. I get up in the morning. I grab my cup of coffee. I have to have something to eat because, you know, the, my sugars. And I go sit down and God and I have a great time. We start praying, and he starts adjusting and talking. And in that session, he gets me right tuned in, tuned up, and plugged in for the day. Already victory, the day is completely already taken care of. And as long as got my eye on through the day and not pulled off, then victory will play itself out till the next day where you do the same thing. We're teaching how to maintain a good walk for the glory of God. These are the end times. And even though perilous times are upon us, they're not upon the kingdom of God nor his righteous if they know how to walk with God properly. Say amen, someone. So listen, listen. A couple of points as we go on to the next phrase. He keeps himself and the wicked one does not touch him. Folks, did you know there's a walk where Satan can't touch you? Right there. John is saying, look, they couldn't burn me. They couldn't cook me. They couldn't do anything, but let me live my life out. Let me tell you, there's a walk that you can walk in Jesus if you let Jesus teach you. Learn from me, he said. Learn from me. Stop trying to do everything on your own. Learn from me so he could teach you the right way to walk. Did anybody put their hand on Jesus? Not until he let them. You can do nothing to me unless my father lets you. Do you remember that phrase? And then he turned himself over to be crucified. On purpose. Yeah. Yeah. Are you learning anything? I hope so. 
So let's go on to this phrase. John is really telling us about the walk of grace. So he goes on, he keeps himself and the wicked one touches them not. Verse 19 says, we know that we are of God. How many here know we are of God? And the whole world, listen, lies under the sway of the wicked one. It's called the mystery of iniquity. It's at work. And anybody who wants to get in the flesh, Christian or not, you're going to be affected by it. And the, the rottenness is going to come out of you. If you're a woman, you're going to turn into a nag. If you're a husband, you're going to be a crab, prideful individual. That's what our flesh does. You want to see some good pictures of it? It says, go over in Galatians chapter 5, verse 18. It says, these are all the things that the flesh can do. Adultery, fornication, murder, all this, this awful stuff. Why? Because we're not meant to live in the satanic fallen flesh. We're meant to live from our heart in the spirit. Say amen. You forget. Everyone says, I know what sin is. And then they tell you, well, it's just missing the mark with God. No, it's the very nature of Satan in your flesh. You have the very nature of Satan in your flesh. That's why you age. And don't look at me like that. I didn't do it. <laughs> Adam did and passed it to you. So you have an incurable disease in your flesh. That's why you bring yourself to God every morning and you throw yourself, your flesh down, not your body down, throw your flesh down and have them crucified, cleanse it up so that you, when you carry it through the day, it's not in your way. Say amen. Be a doer of the word and not just a hearer only. I can tell you, my wife and I have never had so much glorious fun in my life than when we learn these principles. And why would we want to keep them to ourselves? Well, you don't live in a mansion. You don't drive a fancy car. You don't do this. You don't That's all a deception. I live in a simple home. I have a wonderful congregation. I love you dearly. And yet, we're not troubled on this side or troubled on that side. None of it affects our heart because we live for God. Say amen. Ah, oh, Wow. It is absolutely a blessing. So let's go on. So we know where we are of God and the whole world lies under the sway. So don't get into the world. Love not the world. Verse 20 says, and we know the son of God has come. How many here know that Jesus came? And he has given us a what? It's not what you're taught. It's what you caught. Okay. Given us an understanding. What's the understanding, Pastor Kerry? That we may know him who is true and that we are in him. Where? Where are we? Where are we? We're not out here. We're in him who is true. In his son, Jesus Christ, this is the what? So listen, I'm going to say something to you, kind of make you think for a minute. Did you know when Adam and Eve sinned, part of God, he lost. Part of his kids, he lost. If I lost a child, I did. One was died at birth. So I have a son waiting for me in, in heaven. I lost him temporarily. Do you understand? So God looks at us as he's lost us and he's gained us back. What makes us think that he's only going to help us a little bit? <laughs> what was his son going to hell all about? Hello. And so Christianity has not been represented properly like it should. You are so covered and so blessed. Getting up in the morning, you should almost feel... It doesn't feel that I should be this blessed. Yes, yes, you have hardly tasted anything. Man, look at the Old Testament. Just the people that only knew about God. Look at Solomon. He had piles of silver, didn't know what to do with. My, so, but if you want to look at the outward stuff, yeah, it's no big deal. But it's whether or not we have God keeping us protected in this life. Can you say amen? I want some steak on the plate while I wait, so I need to be following Jesus the way he lays it out. Say amen. And he goes on, and he says, this is the understanding that we are in him who is true, even in his son, Jesus Christ. This is the true God. And then he says, and what? This is the true God and eternal, eternal life. In other words, you being in God is eternal life. Now, eternal life is the word zoe. Zoe means everything that God is, is in his life. So eternal life means life forever with God. Woohoo! Amen. 
So know the little things, the outward things, the discouraging things aren't controlling your life. And if you're letting that run your mood, then you got another God. You ever hear the phrase idolatry? Do you know what idolatry real? Do you know most Christians? I, they, oh, it's a nasty word. I don't know. That means the worship of idols. It just doesn't mean that. It means taking your time and spending it somewhere else other than God. That's all it means. You could be worshiping a stick or, you know, God forbid. <laughs> but when you're so caught up, you can't meet with God. You're beginning to slip into idolatry. Other things are beginning to be in your head attention. So you want to be careful of that. Say amen. I'm not saying you're doing that, but don't slip into that. Because, you know, it can become a real problem. Because one of the first things God says, you shall have no other gods, what? Before me. That's right. So I'm to be the first in your life. Not you. Not anyone else. Amen. And my wife, let me share this with you. My wife and when we got married, we wanted to make sure we were right and we got married and everything. She told me that no one's going to get in between our marriage except for Jesus. He's going to be in between our marriage. So if you start messing up, bye-bye. And if you start, now I'm not trying to, I'm not legalizing divorce. She let me know that Jesus was the center of our marriage and the only way it would work is for us to love him. Can you say amen? And when we're loving him, he's making and blending the marriage to work. What God puts together, no man can what? Draw apart. The trouble is on my first marriage, I did that. <laughs> There was no God putting us together. Hello? So, no, I'm not giving you a license to get mad at your spouse and write them off. No, you better stay together. But what I'm saying is we're married to Jesus, aren't we? You know, for when I first got saved, I really got saved. Got spirit filled. I loved the Lord. But I, I found I was just dating him. What do you mean, Pastor Kerry? Well, I would talk to him a lot when I was in trouble or things weren't working. But when everything was going good, I would just sort of forget about him. And God said one day, son, why are you dating me? Dating you? I knew exactly what he meant. I said, dating you? He says, yeah, you're dating me. You're only meeting with me when you feel it's important. Instead of meeting with me because I am important. I said, oh, God. You know, God does that and he puts no condemnation with it. And I said, oh, Lord, you know, and he says, son, I want you to marry me. That means if you're going to go anywhere, tell me. And if you're going to make a big decision, pray so that I'm in charge and can tell you if that's going to work or not work. Marry me so I can become your partner and not just somebody you agree with once in a while. Amen. So let's get on to this. Boy, I'm talking and taking a lot of time. So then it goes on. He says, little children, keep yourself from what? Idols. Well, of course, you're not going to worship your coffee cup. Hello? And you're not going to do silly things like that. But you can become a, a workaholic. No, I'm, again. Or you can become someone that is so locked up in something that that very thing has got control of you. Don't be that way. Say amen. Don't be that way because it's bondage. God doesn't want us bound up with something. He wants us to enjoy it and to be able to utilize what's on the earth for the glory of God. Amen. It's like my car. I asked God. I got sometime I will tell you all just about my my vehicles. First car I got was a little Ford Ranger, and I prayed over it, paid twenty twelve hundred dollars for it. It ran. I put over five hundred thousand miles on it. Didn't burn any oil. Not only that, but when I was done with it and got ready for my nether, nether, the God truck that we, God was going to give me next, I gave it away to a brother, and he drove it for another 250,000 miles. And I just gave it in to somebody else. Pray over your stuff. That's what I did. And the God says, you want to see? So one day I'm driving for my company, and I'm going up. It's Safeway. I was driving Safeway, delivering home groceries. And I'm driving over the hill, and God says, almost audibly, you want to see your new truck? I says, yeah. I drive over the hill, and there's this beautiful purple truck, Ford 150, you know, uh, 5.0, and had four, 
five speed, two drive, everything I wanted, just right there. One owner, I went in, oh, we got to get it. And then, of course, I couldn't drive anymore with my, the clutch because of my foot. You be careful, you don't want your foot slipping off the clutch and rearing in. And, and so uh, we prayed and God gave us another car and it still runs, but it's just sitting over there. I didn't want to pay for two licenses. And on to the, finally our, our car, and God says, you want to see the next car you got? I said, what have you been praying and claiming? I said, well, I've been asking God for, I've been asking you for uh, a Lexus because they hold up better than pretty much anything else. And he says, okay. And then my wife gets this idea. She wants to go down, finds a Lexus. It's from Hawaii. It has less than 86,000 miles. It's a 2005. Our payments are so affordable. I'm just so ecstatic. The guy almost cried to give it away. He was going to save it for his father. Now, that was God's gift. If God can do that for this donkey, he certainly can bless all of you. And so what I want to try to tell by that is to get you to believe for greater things and just hold fast to your consistency. So everyone say, I'm in Christ and Christ's in me. And I'll give you one more scripture for that. And that scripture is in Acts chapter 17, verse 28. And it says, for in him we live and move and have our existence. And also, as some of even your poets know, that for we truly are his offspring. So you and I move and groove in God. Can you say amen? But it's, it's when we take charge with our mind that we move ourselves out of the awareness of God into the awareness of self. And so how often does it, I mean, how quickly can I be aware of God? Just close your eyes and say, Jesus, and you're aware of God. How quickly can they get unaware of God? As soon as you get your eyes on you. <laughs> so what are you what are you doing? You're learning how to walk with God in the spirit realm. Say amen. Point two, everyone say, all right, the mystery of the mustard seed. Now, a mystery teaching is a teaching that you have to get from the spirit. It's the Greek transliteration, which means a hidden teaching revealed onto a certain group. So if you were, uh, you belong to a certain um, club, in order for you to be an officer in a club, you have to know what the secret teachings are. Well, we have to belong to God's club in order to know his mysteries. Can you say amen? Well, how do we do that? You get saved. You say, Jesus, come into my heart. You get born again. Now you are part of God's club. Now the mysteries are for you to understand. It's given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven, Jesus said. All right, so listen, look at what he said. The mystery of the mustard seed, Mark 4, 30 through 32. Then he said, to what shall I liken the kingdom, dominion, power, and influence of God? And to what parable shall we picture it? Picture it, see the term? It is like a mustard seed, which is, when it's sown on the ground, is smaller than all the seeds of the earth. But when it is sown, it grows up and becomes greater than all the herbs and shoots out large branches so that the birds of the air may nest in under its shade. It's talking about God in your heart. Hello. When we said, Jesus, come into my heart, be, forgive me of my sin, Jesus came in kind of like a seed, a mustard seed. How often have you been he hearing me preach this? So he comes in, and though it be little than the rest of your life, as we go and nurture ourselves with God and become exposed to God, it grows up. Can you say amen? Shoots out great influence and branches. Finally, your life starts taking on favor and blessings, and the kingdom is expanding and growing in you. Can you say amen? Where's it growing? And you, how does God build his kingdom in the earth? By his word. Now remember, at Pentecost, the spiritual kingdom came. But we need his word to agree with the spiritual kingdom. So God says, behold, the sower soweth the word. And the kingdom of God is like a man sowing seed. Some fell by the wayside, some fell on stony ground, some fell on thorny ground, some fell on good ground, which grows up and becomes mustard seed. 
Jesus often said, he said, see that tree? If you have seed, if you have faith as a mustard seed, the key is knowing what a seed does. Now, folks, what's in a corn seed? Corn! Yeah, what's in a love seed? Love! Every action, every word is a seed. You said in your heart, and with your mouth, you believed in your heart, with your mouth, Jesus, I believe you're a Lord, and Jesus came in as a seed. We just got through reading that if we are born again, we have the seed, and we do not sin because of the seed being in us. Amen. Now, that is, remember, John's not talking about your flesh. You, you make plenty of mistakes in your flesh. That's why we're to get out of it, to take the old man off. But we also get problems with our thinking sometimes. I've seen people who let the devil come right and camp in their head, and they think they're seeing things that are not going on. And the devil will do that and move that individual or individuals off by themselves away from the rest of the body of Christ. Now, who's behind that? Hello? Who makes up stories about you? Who's the accuser? So listen, if you're a Christian, don't accuse people. Let it go. They might be guilty, but don't accuse them. Because Satan got you then. Tag, you're it. I have a sermon called Tag, you're it. Every time we blow it, God, Satan tags us, and then we go, Jesus, forgive me, and then ping, and then we get going again, and he tags us again because we keep yielding to his foolishness. Say, not me. <laughs> All right, so let's look at this. Mystery of the, the seed. Okay, so point one, this parable is how the kingdom is built in the earth through the believers who follow Jesus. That's you, too. The spiritual kingdom of heaven came at Pentecost, just like I said, and it's built in us by his word. Three, this makes the spiritual kingdom and its kingdom of heaven and its effects comes to us by the word. But if we're never in the word, we're only going to know God by our kind thoughts. How many know that Satan can reason you out of your own shirt? He's a master con. That's why we live from our childlike heart and not from our intellectual head. Don't get mad at me. Because Satan's much smarter and he doesn't read your mind. But he suggests to your mind. You're getting too ex happy, too excited for God, so he starts suggesting, oh, look what your so-and-so's doing, and look what they're doing. And suddenly your mind pulls out, starts moving off to the left. And if it sits there long enough, you'll start cursing what God has blessed. And you don't want to do that. Say, man, are you hearing me clear? Okay, you don't want to do that. So... Fourthly, let me ask you, who's the mustard seed now? Jesus. And he comes with a kingdom. Can you say amen? He's the king. But you got to stop dating him and start being with him. And you got to figure out what time you're going to give him. You have to invest your time. You see, everything that I love in my life, I've invested time in. Everything you loved in your life, you vested time in. And don't tell me you love God and you spend no time with him. Then with ears, let them hear. Spend time with God. I don't know what to do when I'm just be with him, tell him you love him. You mean a whole half an hour of just loving on God? Yes. I guarantee you probably hardly can get up after you do that. You're so filled with his presence. See, but we don't press on in those areas. We press on to get the job done. And we're living for God in the flesh. You can't live naturally for God and be a success. You have to live spiritually before God as a child. Say, oh me. Okay. So you know who the mustard seed is and how his kingdom is built in you, so don't stay away from the word. So stay consistent, which I would always tell Sherry. Sherry's been coming to here about seven plus years. She'd show up and then three months later it would show up again. 
and then we love on her and show up again. I know you're probably watching, Cherry, so it's, it's good. And, you know, and just kind of um, modge podge. But every time I would encourage her and say, stay consistent. If I can get you exposed to God the way God wants you exposed to, you'll thank me so much. You'll thank, you'll be so completely changed. Just listen and just stay consistent no matter whatever. Stay the course. Say amen. Because what is Satan trying to do? He's trying to trip us up, trying to move us around. You know, God's working one way, and, he, and then you move off some other way. You know, that kind of confusion is not from God. Where there's strife and confusion, the Bible says there is every evil work in James. All right. So Colossians, listen to this. I love this. Colossians chapter 2, 8 and 10 says, Why is Jesus like a seed? Colossians 2, 8 through 10. Beware lest anyone cheat you through philosophy and empty deceits called religion. According to the traditions of men, according to the basic principles of the world, and not according to Christ. For in him, listen, for in him, how many here in Christ? How many here in Christ? For in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead, what? You have all of God at your disposal. Because you're in who? Now, so you get out in the morning, you're in God, you're doing good, the day's going great, you're loving the Lord and everything, and then somebody says something to you and then you start railing on them. Now you're not in God. You're in the flesh. And now you're open for things to come your way that you don't want. Get out of the flesh. Everyone say, don't, you can step in it, but don't live in it. <laughs> Come on, you can step in your flesh, but you can't live in it. There's not, listen, your flesh in itself is, it can be good. You can have great things because our flesh is simply a machine that serves us or supposed to serve us. You see, when I want to grab my fork and, and put it in the food and bring it up to my mouth, there's a lot of connections going on there. So your body is involved, but it's not being evil unless you overeat all the time. And put a knife to your throat. That's what the Proverbs says. Solomon was right to the point. If you're going to eat and be overweight and not take care of your diet and self-control, put a knife to your throat and get rid of yourself. That's what he said. Thank God, don't do that. Just ask God to help you like me. I used to weigh 325 pounds. I have a picture of me. That's why I had the diabetes and all that kind of stuff. And thinking in the back of my mind, oh, that's all right. But see, you're, 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 you're a weight problem, an alcohol problem, any kind of problem. You and God deal with that situation. Now listen, and he will help you overcome it. There's no such thing as you be held to bondage all your life. So if there's something that's out of order in your life, I'm not going to condemn you. And my wife is certainly not. And we're not going to criticize you because that's not what we do. I can't be as blessed as I am and do that kind of stuff. No, I'm going to love you. But if you, anytime you need help and you come to me, he says, you, you got any suggestions? I'm going to give you all the God things I know. You see? And when we got society, it's, a society is mean. Have you figured that out? They're mean. So don't live for the world. Don't live in the world. They're mean. Love the world so they can find your Jesus. All right, let's go on. Thank God we've got to move on here. Controlling our GPS system, our third point. How many know your mouth has a lot of power in it? What does the scripture say? Death and life are in the power of the tongue, right? Our mouth. Can you say amen? James writes a whole chapter three about it. And he talks about how when we use our mouth correctly, by the help of the Holy Spirit, we can literally steer our life to success. Hello? We can. In fact, there's a lot of worldly people, you know, doing things and using these biblical principles in sort of a new age thing. There's an old film out, they called it The Gift. And it's, a real, it's just simply biblical things without God mentioned in it. I, I don't recommend you watch it because it's all a bunch of hyperbole. And, but there's all kinds of stuff out there. Let's say I forget one of the ladies, wealthiest ladies in the world, a black lady, sweet lady, and she, she does love God, even though we see her do all kinds of things. She will say, that my thankfulness to God 
and she will say, you got to learn to bring your energy up. And so she's getting a hold of biblical things without talking about God. So you're going to see in these last days a lot of people who are talking generally about godly things, but really they're talking about spiritual principles they shouldn't be playing around with without Jesus. Can you say amen? Because when you start opening spiritual things, you're getting into the cult or what is hidden, and you can't do it without Jesus. So if you get to opening doors like with the Ouija boards and Sarah and tarot cards and things like that, of course you know, then you're going to open up something and a, and a demon is going to attach itself to you. And we don't want to do that. Can you say amen? So just know, from my words, no enemy can attach himself to you. A curse does not come without cause. Okay? So everyone say, I'm redeemed from the curse. I walk with Jesus. I don't have to be concerned about it. But you will have to be concerned about it if you stay in unforgiveness, if you won't release people of their debts, if you're messing with the cult or un, uh, with, uh, um, I'm trying to think of the, um, the other word. Oh, well, it doesn't really, when you're messing where you shouldn't be, eventually the enemy's going to catch wind of it and then zap you. And you don't want that happening. Say amen. You want the devil running from you. Why? Because God lives in you. When you open your mouth, God comes out. And he does sound just like you. Amen. Are you still with me? All right, controlling our GPS system. James 3, 1 through 5. My brethren, let not many of you become teachers. If you want my job, here come. Knowing that we shall receive a stricter judgment. For we all stumble in many things. There's a reality right there. That's in the flesh. If anyone does not stumble in what? Word. He is a... Mature, a perfect man, able to bridle or control his whole body. Just by your words alone, you can stop eating too much. By your words alone, you can get delivered. You can frame your world by the words of your mouth. The trouble is, we speak too much in the negative. Oh, I just don't like that, Pauline. You know what I mean? <laughs> Sorry, I used your name. You have to get the tape. You follow what I'm saying? So you can't have just two fountains coming out of the side of your mouth. God needs to work on you so you shut one fountain down. Can you say amen? All right, look what else it says. Indeed, we put bits in horses' mouths, and they obey us, and we turn their whole body. Horses are much larger than us. Look also at the ships. Though they be very large and are driven by fierce winds, they are turned by a little small rudder wherever the pilot directs it. You're the pilot of your life. First pilot of success was to surrender and accept Jesus. Can you say amen? And they say, Lord, take control of my mouth. Hello. Amen. Why? Because this is the steering wheel. Hello. How you doing, sister? Oh, I don't know. It's pretty rough under these circumstances. You're heading for the ditch. Tell me all about your circumstances. <laughs> Hello? Moving faster, okay? So the control of our life is actually in the rudder of our mouth. So let's turn it over to Jesus. Say amen. And let God control our tongue. Notice the word says we are able to control, bridle our whole body. The key is to not stumble in foolish words. Jesus says, by your words you'll be justified, by your words you will be condemned. All right, so let's go on. Almost done with you. You see, the word says we can't tame the tongue. So we turn our life over to God so he can tame the tongue. Two, we are snared by the words of our mouth, Proverbs 6, 2. So a lot of times people will literally set themselves up by what they say. Hello, what do you mean? I tell you what, I was so happy it almost killed me. Why do we express life with death? Just a thought. 
I'm just, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on anybody, but just a thought. Because we are running a lot of times on idle and not paying attention. We're sort of gliding along and somebody says something and some comes out. And see, that kind of Christianity, you're still going to suffer a lot because there's a lot of you flapping. I mean, a lot of your flesh flapping around. Don't get mad at me. It's kind of like a fish out of water. Have you ever seen a fish? You catch and then it get, you bring it into the boat. What does it do? <laughs> kind of like a Christian who doesn't know the word. <laughs> I got to laugh because you don't have anything to justify yourself because you don't know the word. So you're taught what well, God will work something out somehow and, and it's good. He does. He loves you. But we should know more than that. Say amen. Pastor Kerry, don't you go out in the road. The cars are out there. Hello. You don't play with the gun. You might shoot somebody's eye out. All right, let's move right on. Why do you do that, Pastor? Because I have a good time sharing the word. All right, let's go back down to James. Look at verse 8. It says, but no man can tame the tongue. For it's an really evil, full of deadly poison. With it we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men. Don't be a man cursor. Don't curse things, don't curse men, don't curse anything. Because as a person sows, so shall he. So even if you're justified and you say, I just curse that whole thing, don't do that. People get mad at me and say, why do you teach people not to rail on the devil and, why, and to start taking that authority and doing all that kind of It says, because you're out of order. You know how I rebuke the devil and it works just fine? Jesus, get him. I just release him out of here. When I lay hands on the sick, I want to tell you this. You're, you're God's people. I just bring God out of here and through my arm. How do you do that? Everybody can do it. Hang around, we'll teach you. You're full of God. You got a dose of that last Sunday. Wasn't that good? That's just nothing. So begin to understand who you are in Christ. The rest is just stuff. Okay, let's focus in how sensitive we are with Christ. Amen. So he says, look it. Does a spring send forth both fresh water and bitter? You have two springs. You have a fleshly spring and you have a spiritual born again spring. Which one is speaking? How often are they speaking? You have two of you, the old man and the new man. Is the old man overriding your new man? Has the old man shut down the testimony of the new man? Or have you gone and done what is right, meet with God, so the new man outshines the old man? And your relatives, your brothers, your sisters say, oh my gosh, your life is changing. And that will win them to the Lord. Not, you, not just your words, or are you just doing what you do? It's the God's glory working in you. It will change them because God will make them see it. Hello? God will make them see the good. That's why we have to trust God in that area. So he goes on further. It says, can men, big, uh, uh, big, oh, I believe that, can <laughs> Can a fig tree, my brethren, bear olives, or a grapevine bear figs? Well, the answer is no. So we shouldn't spring forth bitter and, and sweet water. We should shut one of those water fountains down. Say amen. And then finally, who is wise and understanding among you? Everyone say me. <laughs> Let him show by a good mannerism or good conduct that his works are done with meekness of wisdom. But the wisdom which is from God is first pure, peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy, good fruits, without partiality, without hypocrisy. Now the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's you. Say amen. So you have a wonderful kingdom developing on the inside of you. And as you get farther with God, every level... There's a new devil. What do you mean by that? There's new challenges. As you grow in the Lord, there's new challenges because you begin to see differently. 
you begin to see the way God sees. The challenges are not so fierce. You can see them farther away. Pretty soon, God will get you so caught up in him, you'll recognize when he's close by, but he's still a day off. Hello. Remember, Satan doesn't know the future, so he tries to work your future for his evil. When we pray and we seek God, we destroy all that with the light of God. Can you say amen? For God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. So project the light of God. And, and guaranteed, I'd rather bless you with God in me than me with me. Hey, would you have a, like another dose of carry? No, no. All right. So we need to understand. All right. So are we wise? Let's control our lips. Say amen. All right. And then the final point, I believe this is the final point. I want to make sure I, I got it. Is having our eyes focused on who? On Jesus Christ. Easy said, easy said. Folks, how many's ever been in school? Remember when you had to study for a test? What did you end up having to do? Focus on the test. Now here's how Satan works. He'll give you a, try to give you a problem, and then he'll have you try to focus on the problem and suggesting that you might come up with a solution on your own. Whenever there's a problem that seems to work, go right to prayer and say, God, deal with this, take care of it, and show me, if I need to, what I need to do. If you do it that way, that problem won't continue. God will arrest that problem and put it back in order. But it's when we comment on it, we try to reason with it, and, and some of that's okay, we often do the wrong thing. And so we want to always follow God with our heart, letting God lead the way. He's our shepherd. The Lord is my shepherd, and I? Yeah. If you got a lot of want, man, you better get the shepherd back where he belongs. <laughs> All right. Having our eyes focused on Christ. Luke chapter 11, verse 33 through 36. No one, when he has lit a lamp, you got born again, puts it in a secret place or under a basket, but on a lampstand that those who come in may see the light. What's he talking about? Who's the light of your life? He's the light bulb. Can you say amen? And in like a projector, he shines out through the lens. I hope I knocked it off. As he shines out through the lens, what the lens, how clear the lens is, or unclear the lens is, will project on our life. So here's perfect projecting through imperfectness onto the, the walk of our life. So that's why we're to get our mind in the Word of God and in the presence of God so God can clean your window. Don't look at me that way. To clean your lens. You know about cleaning. And so we keep, meet with God so he keeps cleansing the lens so we can see through his eyes and not taint it through the way we think things are. Hello? If you think I'm mad at you, even though I'm not mad at you, you're going to treat me like I'm mad at you. Hello? Trick of the devil. And if you think I'm a bad person and you don't never figure it out if I am or not, <laughs> then you're going to always treat me like a bad person. See, Satan wants to get a hold of the control of your thinking. That's why we cast down imaginations, every high thing, every thought that works against our walk with God, bringing it into captivity. Say amen. So we're not made a joke of. Man, if your Christianity is going like this, you're a joke. Stop that. Don't get mad at me. Just stop and ask God, why in the world is my life such a roller coaster? Then be ready to listen. You'll just make a couple of adjustments and it'll be fixed. But I'm, uh, I'm more aware than this than, uh, than I ever could be. It's not unanswered prayer that we're dealing with. It's unoffered prayer. People are not praying and being with God like they should. And so we're only seeing little results. 
What happened to all the big moves of God? TBN, CBN, all the uns and ains and big evangelists. And I'll tell you what, they get old and they pass away. Where are the new ones? Playing church. Running around trying to build their ministries instead of following God and preaching God. And that's my conviction. I just done got off the box. But that's the truth. Does it matter? I don't want a huge church, but if I get one, fine. But you see, my goals aren't trying to do something for God. My goals are to please God and be with God, and he will do something through me and with me. Say amen. Woo, that's the good stuff. And listen, there are a lot of Christians that are afraid to get into the kitchen and start cooking. They're, they're going to the churches that are already established, and they're calling them theirs. Oh, I love my church. You haven't done anything to build it. So stop calling it yours. There's only one church anyway. And the devil's put names on them, so we're all divided. Oh, silly stuff. Remember, united we stand, divided we what? So guess what? Every one of you, I can agree with the God in you. Amen. I don't look at the things that you're doing wrong. That's not my business. That's between you and the Lord. But it affects the church and the sheep, of course. But anyway, I want you to let you know, you guys are very blessed. Amen. All right. Eyes focused on Christ. Then he says, look, it goes on further to say, therefore, when your eye is good or single, your whole body be with full of light. And when your eye is bad or out of focus, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, now listen, take heed that the light which is in you be not what? Let me put it in modern language. Be careful what you focus on is not negative, so it overwhelms the light. It's darkness. What do you mean? If you're dwelling on problems all the time, then you're problem conscious. Hello? If you're dwelling on the word, then you are word conscious. You are a Polaroid camera on two legs. Whatever you dwell on is going to show up. So if you're dwelling on problems and faults and what's wrong with this, then you're going to produce that. You're going to complain when everybody's praising. Hello? Now remember, I'm dealing with some little foxes, so I'm not picking on you guys, but that's who you are. So don't focus on problems, because you don't have all that much brains to fix them. Focus on Jesus and let him give you the wisdom to deal with the situation. Say amen. Scott will tell you. Many times he didn't know what to do, and God dropped in some wisdom. I can tell you thousands of times God did that with me, and will do it with you too. Say amen. Finally, we have to focus on Christ. We are now born again. We are lit up with God's light. Let it shine out. Keep your mind in the word. The lamp of our body is the eye. If your eye is focused on two things, a double-minded man is unstable, right? So we want to keep our eyes focused on God. We're going to see things peripherally, but those are just distractions. Treat your walk with God as number one priority. Your husband or wife, second. Hello. And your walk with them, get after it, because these are the last days. God wants you protected, he wants you wise, and he wants you effective. Can you say amen? And not sitting around, barely holding on, waiting for the rapture to come. I believe in the rapture, by the way. All right, so everyone say, stay focused. So we are to be careful not to let what we are focusing on to be the problems of life or the circumstances of life. Rather, that's the world. But to have our minds set on things above, can you say amen? And so listen to this last scripture and then we're done. Second Corinthians 4, 2 through 4 says, But if we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of truth, commending ourselves to all of your conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel was veiled or hidden, it was hidden to those that are perishing whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe in the light 
of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, unless it shine unto them. So in other words, unless we're focusing on the right thing, then we're going to absorb the right thing. So as your pastor, I want to encourage you that a lot of the stuff that we see going on in the United States and in the world and stuff is what has been spoken of almost 2,000 years ago. It is no big deal, even though it's so right up in our face. The key is don't get distracted. Don't be pulled away with other things. Now, I know you have a job, and I know you do things. You have a family. This is not a distraction. This is all part of the same, the same thing. What distractions are are things pulling you away from your personal walk with God. You don't want anything like that. Say amen. You want to become so close with Jesus that he's your warning system. Amen. He can let you know. Do you know he warned me about this about two years before I actually had the problems with my legs? I couldn't understand what he was doing. It took me a while to, to wake up. Sometimes we can be in a religious stupor and not know it. Lord bless you and keep you. Watch over you and hold you. Let his light shine on you. May the word of God ring in your memory all day long until it comes up to the eyes of your understanding. And then may God walk his life and his will out in your life. In Jesus' name, and everyone said? Amen. Amen. Thank you for putting up with me.